Okay, I think we're going to be ready to get started shortly. If we could ask our friends from the Department of Social Services to assemble. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining uh, this joint meeting of or informational forum of the Appropriations and Human Services Committees. Uh, this is a uh, another busy day at the Capitol, so we're going to see people coming uh, in and out of this hearing. Uh, but we did want to get started uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and we are looking today at the recently released uh, Medicaid rate report uh, that came from the Department of Social Services. And we've been joined uh, by uh, the commissioner. Uh, and uh, you know, please, commissioner, if you could uh, identify, uh, we all know who you are, Commissioner Barton Reeves, but if you could identify yourself uh, and as well the, the gentleman who's sitting next to you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So good afternoon, and thank you for having us here today. Uh, I'll just read a very brief formal statement before we begin, if that's all right with you. Actually, before we do that, I was remiss. I'd like to just ask my uh, co-chair, Representative Gilchrist, if she has uh, any opening Certainly. remarks. And if we're joined by the uh, appropriate chairs, we'll also uh, include them as well. Great. Thank you, Senator. Good to see you both. Thank you for being here. Just really um, looking forward to the conversation. This is kind of a long-anticipated um, study, not that you know we just phase one we've been wanting to address. So um, looking forward to the conversation and questions asked. Thank you. Uh, and, and with that, uh, Commissioner, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Lesson, Representative Gilchrist, and ranking members of the Human Services and Appropriations Committees, I am Andrea barton Rees, the Commissioner of the Department of Social Services. And today we are here to present the results of phase one of a part of a two-part study for Medicaid. So before I turn the presentation over to Guy Woolston, our Medicaid Director, Nicole Godburn, who leads Medicaid rate study setting for the state and Bill Halsey, our deputy Medicaid director, I would like just to take a moment to create some context. First, the two-part study is one of several tools and points of critical information that we will use as a state to make planful decisions around rate setting for now and the future. States with successful rate setting methodologies have used rate studies, member feedback, provider input, and a timeline for rate setting that is often aligned with their state budget cycles, policy initiatives, and member needs. And our recommendation is that as we, as we move forward, we take into account all of the factors that might impact setting rates. This report covers specific provider types and certain codes within those provider types. And it's also important to keep in mind that the report covers 18% of overall providers in the industry with an array of services on, that are covered under Medicaid that are also provided by many of our sister agencies, including DMIS and DDS. And so it is, it is within this context that we present an overview of the rate study, and I turn the presentation over to Guy Woolston, our Medicaid Director for the State of Connecticut. Thank you. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Guy Woolston, Medicaid Director here. Um, Senator Lester, Rep. Gilchrist, I know you are very familiar with the study, but we are hoping to take just a small number of minutes for those of your colleagues who are not as familiar, walk through a couple basic context and facts for the study, and then the bulk of the time, obviously, for, for questions from you all, if, that, if that's okay. Great. Um, Chandra, would it be possible to project the slides? And we do have two hours for this, so we'll have a lot of time for, for questions. I know this is primarily an opportunity for a question and answer. If you could go to the first slide, that'd be great. Uh, just a little bit of context for this study. So Connecticut is a managed fee-for-service state. And that means, unlike many other states here in Connecticut, the Connecticut state government directly sets the rates that we pay providers, like dermatologists, hospitals, and nursing homes. Um, last session, the legislature passed and uh, directed DSS to perform a two-part study to examine how our rates compare to Medicare and Medicaid. And I'll give you a little bit more context on that in a moment. Phase one, um, which is completed and we're talking about today, focuses on several specific issues that we are directed to in statute, behavioral health, dental, physician, um, and uh, professional services. And as the commissioner mentioned, those services represent 18% of the total pie. So less, a little bit less than one fifth 
is in phase one. The, the four fifths is coming in phase two. We looked at 11,000 codes um, and a code for those of you who aren't familiar, that, that's the, kind of the specific way that we pay uh, providers. Um, and we compared them to Medicare. We compared them to five other Medicaid states. Um, and then the report has a number of recommendations to promote a more rational rate setting process. So that's the overall context for this report. Um, next slide. Just a little bit of uh, context on what a rate study is and is not. And I won't read all the words on the slide, but at a high level, the rate study is a way to give policymakers such as yourselves tools and information to compare the rates that we pay to peer payers like Medicare and Medicaid. It is not an enactment of any change. Um, and it's not a golden ticket telling you this is the truth of what to do or what not to do. It's rather giving you general guidance and information that can help make informed policy recommendations. Next slide. So on the overall approach, um, in phase one, we looked at those nine categories lifted here, listed here, which were um, set in statute. When possible, we benchmarked our rates to Medicare. Now, Medicare is the national payer, right, for, for elderly and, and disabled people. Um, and Medicare has a comprehensive rate setting methodology. I can go into the details later if it's helpful, but just at a high level, Medicare Part B, which these services overlap with, there's a comprehensive process called the ROC, where every five years at a minimum, Medicare carefully updates rates, thinking about the physician costs, the costs of running an office, malpractice insurance, things like that. I mean, there, there's a rational process for, for setting those rates. Merely for comparison and illustration purposes only, we use 80% of Medicare as what we're calling a benchmark. That's not a normative statement about what the world should be, but just for the study, we're going to set 80% as, as the, um, the point of comparison. So we first look to Medicare. Now, Medicaid covers additional services that Medicare does not cover. So for those services that are not covered by Medicare, we need to look somewhere else. And the statute that you all passed last session, I think very sensibly, directs us to look at Medicaid. Uh, we picked five states, Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Oregon, um, as our comparison. Why did we pick five versus 49 states? Well, unfortunately, Medicaid data is complicated and it's a mess. And we um, didn't have, we don't have the time or resources to look through every single state. So we tried to pick five states that are broadly similar in terms of their economic conditions, the overall structure of their Medicaid program, in many cases, geography, um, et cetera. Um, so that's how we picked those five states. So again, we're first going to look to Medicare. And when we have a match there, we'll look at 80%. When we don't have a match, we'll look to Medicaid and we'll look to 100% of the median of the five states, um, the five other states. Great. Uh, next slide. So this slide summarizes our major findings. There are 55 pages in the report. There's a lot of information. We tried to really boil it down. Um, the first one um, is just basic uh, coverage. The basic point is here, we matched we found a match for almost all of the, the dollars in phase one. So 92% of the, remember we, the Medicaid program, right? We're looking at phase one is one fifth of the, the Medicaid program. Of that one fifth, almost all 90, 92%, um, we, we found a match either in Medicare or Medicaid, which is great and which we expected, but I think it's comforting to know uh, that we, we have good, good kind of comparison. The second major funding, uh, finding is that there is a lot of variation within service categories. And what I mean by that is, let's just take the biggest um, by dollars, the biggest of the nine buckets, the physician outpatient. So on, on average, Husky was paying 65.3% of the Medicare comparison. That's on average. That average though hides a lot of variations. Some of the codes were paying substantially above that 65%, and some were paying substantially below that 65%. I bring that up just to highlight that insofar as you all think, and you may not, but insofar as you think that the Medicare approach is kind of a sensible benchmark, around that average, there's just a lot of there's a lot of variation for historical reasons. We can get into that in the QA if, if you want, but I think it's a really striking finding. Just sometimes we're paying a lot better and sometimes we're paying maybe not not as well around that average. I think it's a really important finding. The third finding is that if you look across those nine categories, there was a huge amount of variation um, in how we were paying relative to our benchmarks. So um, many of the benchmarks we are paying 
in the 70s, 80s, um, or 90% relative to our benchmarks. Behavioral health clinic, we were paying 44% of the benchmark pay payments, and dental was at 100%. So there's a, there's a chart in the appendix we can flip to at the very end that just shows you there's a lot of variation uh, across the different categories. And then within each of those nine bars, there's a lot of variation within. And just a, a quick commentary, that variation, I think, is illustrative, I think, of the reasons why you all asked us to do this study in the first place, that Connecticut hasn't always had the most rational process for setting rates. And I think those two findings really underscore, you know, separate and above from the overall level that we should be paying, there's just a lot of variation um, with, with uh, underneath that average. And then the fourth finding we, we touched on, but uh, the largest difference is in behavioral health. Um, I do want to clarify behavioral health clinic, the, the, the portion studied here, um, the, those providers in many cases do receive non-Medicaid dollars for serving non-Medicaid members um, through our sister state agency, DEMAS. This study was focusing on the Medicaid dollars for the Medicaid rates for the Medicaid members. Um, and that was a, a clear outlier in terms of the lowest percentage of the benchmark. Um, next slide. Um, before I get into the details on the recommendations, I just want to highlight, um, we hired an independent contractor who has done similar rate studies in multiple states. And we do that for a very intentional reason. We wanted a contractor who's going to be able to look objectively at what we're doing here in Connecticut, compare it to Medicare, compare it to Medicaid. They have a number of recommendations in the report, um, many of which are sensible, not all of which we agree with. That's what happens when you, know, you get an independent uh, organization to write a report. I'm going to highlight some of the study authors' recommendations, and I want to be clear. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm trying to neutrally transmit what they said. I'm not speaking on behalf of the department or certainly the administration. Um, the first one focuses on behavioral health. Um, given the the fourth finding that behavioral health clinic was substantially lower than any of the other nine categories, the first recommendation is to, within available resources in the enacted budget to use some of the 7 million state share to help close the gap um, in um, the behavioral health clinic. Uh, and the, the report outlines some, some concrete steps to get there. Um, the second is for the physician specialist rates. Um, those are the ones where we really do have a very good Medicare benchmark, right? Where we don't necessarily need to look to Medicaid. Um, their their um, recommendation is to pick a percent of Medicare and really stick with that. And I think that the rationale for that is Medicare has this built-in, I think, quite rational process for setting those rates. Again, they're required to review every five years at least. If CMS, there's been a, a major technological change or a cost change, CMS will review the rates more frequently. They just have a, a really robust process for setting the rates. So the author's second recommendation is pick a percent of Medicare, and that's going to be a budget and policy question, fine, but pick a percent of Medicare and Tie, tie your rates to those, at least for the subset of services that have a strong Medicare overlap. Um, the third is on autism spectrum disorder, ASD, um, and that's on standardizing the, the rates. Um, there were some inconsistencies um, and differences when we compared the structure of our autism rates to those of our peers um, that the, the, the study um, has some recommendations around. Um, and then uh, the fourth is on dental, uh, kind of similar to the Medicare pick a percent of the five state benchmark and uh, and go from there. Um, next slide. Um, this is my last slide. I'm just gonna flash up a couple graphs at the very end then I'll open up for questions. But in terms of our next steps, at least where the department's coming from, um, we plan to spend the next several weeks getting stakeholder feedback, including from you all, but also from members, from advocates, from providers, from the various constituencies in Medicaid to give us information, to give you all information on how to use the money that's included in the governor's recommended budget to address uh, the issue that's that's found in this report. And we plan to do that very promptly because we know this is a short session. We know you need to make decisions. And so we commit to coming back to you all in six weeks from today with a recommended approach. Um, and the, the second is you know, just reminding you all, last budget, you all passed 7 million state share. Um, to help close this gap, um, and our recommendations, we come back. We'll come back. Uh, we'll, we'll be within that that seven million appropriated. The last thing I'll just touch on before before I conclude and open up to to question and answer, John. If you just go forward two slides, I just want to spend two minutes just on these graphs because I think sometimes a picture is um, a picture is uh, is worth a thousand words. 
So the second finding that we talked about, I mentioned there's a lot of variation within service categories. And this just shows you graphically what that looks like. So this is taking one of those nine categories and just giving you a sense of that, of that variation. On average, we are at 65% of Medicare, but you can see that there are some rates where we are at 100, 125%, 150% of Medicare. And then there are some where we are 25, 30% of Medicare. There's just a lot of, um, I'm going to editorialize for a moment, er, potentially irrational variation around that Medicare benchmark that I think is really striking. Um, next slide. Um, this is just a visual representation of the third finding, the a lot of variation across those nine categories. Um, so um, this just takes those nine categories and then has a bar chart that shows the percent relative to the benchmark. So that's 80% of Medicare or 100% of the of the five state Medicaid and just ranks them on how, uh, how they are relative to the benchmark, again, for illustrative purposes only. And you can see that the behavioral health clinic is a lot lower than the rest. And you can see, you know, there's there's quite a bit of variation across behavioral health clinic at, at um, in the mid forties, some of the other ones in the seventies um, up to, to 90 or hundred. And then um, if you go forward two slides, if you would, Chandra, um, just the, the last the last um, slide I'll, I'll touch on, this is just a sense of how big each of the nine buckets are, just total spending. Um, and the reason why I wanted to end on this slide is I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that some of these categories are much bigger than others, just in terms of baseline spending. So for example, dental is at roughly $180 million a year, we have a health clinic at $40 million a year. The reason why I wanted to end on this slide is I just want to anchor you all. I'm sure you hear from constituents all the time about um, good and challenges in the Husky program. We know we have them. Um, and I just want you to keep this picture in mind because when you're trying to map what you're hearing from your constituents into the access issues, it's important to keep in mind that some of these buckets are much larger than others. So naturally, for example, I would expect that we would all else equal hear more about dental than you might on, on behavioral health clinic. That's not necessarily saying per member, the access issues are better or worse than the others. It's just um, the, 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 the categories are very different sizes. And I think it's really important to remind folks of that. Um, so that's that's the overview. Hopefully that helps. Just to say again, this is meant to be an objective data-driven look, both across the nine categories and then within them to show the variation. And hopefully this is a useful, one one of many useful tools for you all when you're thinking about the budget setting rates and uh, and next steps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we, uh, we're going to have a, a bunch of, of questions, uh, I suspect, for you, and want to thank you both for uh, your presentation and your willingness to really, you know, think thoughtfully. You're, you're both, uh, we're all new, all the, the, the two co-chairs, and also uh, you all are all new to your positions, and so I think we're all wrestling right now uh, with the Medicaid program and how best to support it, uh, and I want to thank the department for engaging thoughtfully on this uh, question. Um, you know, the, the, the study measured, and this is the fault of the legislature, we charged you uh, with looking at uh, comparisons in terms of rates, and you did that. Um, but it's easy, I think, to confuse or to uh, rates with access, and there's certainly a strong correlation, but they are not the same thing. So how, you know, if, if I were just looking at the rate issue, your findings suggest clearly our top priority should be uh, behavioral health care, then physician specialists, and then, you know, we'll get to the dentist if we if we can. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with what we're hearing on the ground. And I just I, maybe it does or maybe it shouldn't or, or maybe it maybe a not not to. But um, how do we how do we sort of tease out um, access issues from the rates if, if or are those are those two ships going in different directions? In some instances, they are ships going in different directions. And in some instances, there are correlations. We do know this, we do know that CMS tried to do the same thing, try to align rates and access issues, and they are they have yet to be successful in finding uh, a, a specific path forward. It, it isn't necessarily a wrong thing to really rely on what you're hearing, I'll just say anecdotally from, from people, because it really depends on where constituents live, how many providers are available to them, how they can get access to those providers literally with transportation or telehealth or, or any other means by which they may receive their services. We do think that the disparity that you see in the behavioral health fees versus uh, as compared to other states is concerning, which is why after we finish our stakeholdering, we'll be able to come back with a recommendation around that. But we do know that 
uh, whether you are a Medicaid member or not, access continues to be a challenge because there are a dearth of providers just in certain spaces, whether you have commercial insurance or, or you're, you're covered under Medicaid. So sometimes the access issue has more to do with whether or not there is a provider available in a specific specialty space. And it may be, it could be exacerbated by lower fees. And that is, I think, what we'd like to get closer to in phase two and do some more digging as we stakeholder. So a stakeholder, you know, a stakeholder engagement will allow us to hear from providers that might say, I, I have a Medicaid panel. I don't believe that the rates that I'm receiving for behavioral health, for example, allows me to take on more patients into my panel because. I have a cost benefit analysis, I have offices, I have overhead and I have other things that I need to do. That's why the stakeholdering is a, is a really critical piece, but the rates allow us to at least begin to know where to ask those more pointed questions around access so we can gather more information. Yeah, um, the only thing I completely agree with the commissioner, obviously, Senator, I do want to give a little bit of a spirited defense of the of the legislation that, that you all passed last session. I, I do think comparing Comparing rates, uh, particularly to Medicare, but also to Medicaid, I think is really, really helpful. I, I think we can all agree, conceptually, access is the thing we ultimately care about. But as the commissioner said, it is really challenging to measure access, um, particularly when you're comparing across very different specialty, comparing dental access to be able to clinic to um, physician access. And for what it's worth, you know, Medicare, not that they do everything right, but they don't they don't try like when they're setting their rates in medicare part b they're basically doing a cost informed approach and i can go into detail, details if you want of how they do that but conceptually they think about okay well for every single code how many minutes of physician time how many physicians of nurse time how what's the malpractice insurance what does it cost around the office they're kind of building up the calculations that way and i think the reason that medicare doesn't do something different which is like oh well let's every year increase where the access is challenging is with eleven thousand codes it is just not feasible to be able to really accurately measure access at that level of granularity that um, that we would need. And the 11,000 codes is, again, only for 18% of the Medicaid program. So anyway, I just want to give a spirit of defense. I think this is a really useful tool. I'm really glad you asked us to do it. And while I, I very much agree access is really important, I think it is useful for broad trends rather than specific. It's just infeasible to, to get down to the level of granularity um, just given the number of codes. Uh, and so my second question, if I may, before I turn it over to the many members who have questions, um, is on process. And I know that you are, you know, a, the, the agency that actually delivers the services, you're not the state's budgeting agency and the governor has a say. Um, but you know, I've heard a couple of things. One, that there's this process underway right now to evaluate the recommendations and to engage stakeholders. Uh, but I'm also concerned because we're still a year away from phase two of the study. And so what is your sense of a way forward in terms of uh, adopting some or all of these recommendations and figuring out how much uh, we can invest to, you know, help correct this wrong? How do we, how do you see the, the way forward at this point? Thank you for the question. The, we see the way forward within the available appropriations of the $7 million to really follow the two bullets that we had, which is to engage in our stakeholdering, which we have really shortened that time period to six weeks because we really want to accomplish the stakeholder engagement within this session and come back with the recommendations and then actually be able to implement those rate increases within uh, the appropriations, uh, sorry, the appropriations with, within hopefully before the end of the fiscal year. That really is our goal to really move very quickly. Uh, I would say that when the other states that we've chosen, five states, as you know, has been our model, but in other states that have also engaged in rate studies, it usually takes them well over a year to engage in this process. So we are compressing really sometimes what is a year to an 18 month process into, into about six, to be quite honest with you. But we know how important that is. And when you can see the significant disparity in the rates, particularly around behavioral health, it, it gives us a sense of urgency around moving uh, in that direction. So we're, we will be moving, we will be coming back with recommendations as to what to do with the $7 million rather quickly. I can't speak right now because I think it would be premature to speak as to what would happen in phase two, because we are just starting it. We don't really have anything, quite frankly, where we have a framework as to how we'll move forward. And uh, our study authors know very well what categories to follow and the, and the process that we want to follow there. 
Uh, so that is the process as we've defined it right now is really to move very quickly and to be able to make recommendations as soon as possible. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I, I would just add, you know, $7 million is um, a lot of money for many of us, but it is a, you know, just even on the behavioral health side of the ledger is a, you know, drop of, in the bucket, relatively speaking. And so um, I know you cannot commit to go beyond the governor's authorized, you know, the, the budget. Uh, but, you know, my thought is if we are serious about uh, addressing the specific issues outlined in this report, we're going to need to go well beyond that. And so I'm hoping um, that other folks uh, who uh, can go beyond the governor's uh, authorized budget will, you know, respond to that and, you know, acknowledge the need that's that's out there. Uh, and um, we may not be able to address the entire issue this session for a variety of reasons, but I'm hoping we can do a make a serious dent that goes well beyond the $7 million that, that we budgeted last last June before we knew the results of the study. Um, and with that, Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Senator, and thank you both. Um, as the Senator mentioned, we all kind of came in together and it's been really helpful learning from you all um, about Medicaid. And so um, really appreciative of this uh, partnership. I'm going to dive a little into each of the sections. We are doing the two question rule, and then we'll circle back with folks. Um, but with the behavioral health, and you were just speaking to it, correct me, please, if I got any of this wrong, but um, the study speaks to the 12 codes um, and rates for behavioral health services, um, and that although these codes included all clinic types, the claim data for those 12 codes were only used by behavioral health clinics. So can you just speak to that a little more? What does that mean? What are the behavioral health clinics? Does this mean private behavioral health um, services don't take Medicaid? Like, is that where that was coming from? No, no, please go Okay, ahead. great. I will, um, great question, Representative. I will answer it. And I'm gonna look also to my esteemed colleague, Bill Halsey, Deputy Director. Bill, if I say anything wrong, please come up and, uh, and correct me, I, I may well. Um, the behavior, so great. Um, so the, of the nine categories listed in the report, the behavioral health category, the one with the 44% is focusing specifically on something called behavioral health clinic, which is a, which is a billing type. Um, and that is not the universe of all behavioral health services and codes, right? There, there are, uh, a psychiatrist, uh, practicing on her own, um, providing behavioral health services. She would not be in a, in a clinic. Um, she'd be under the physician, um, the physician specialty uh, category. Uh, I'm trying to answer all parts of your question, Representative. Uh, I think your second question was on: Do you, are there are there behavioral health providers who do not take Medicaid? Uh, there are, there are, yes, for, for sure, there are who don't take Medicaid. Um, I'm going to say something really obvious. I just make sure we're on the same page. We're we're looking at the Medicaid rates and billing, and so if a provider doesn't take Medicaid, uh, she's kind of not in this. She's not in the study. Um, and even within the behavioral health clinic, as I mentioned earlier, I just want to underscore the state and federal government supports behavioral health clinics through several ways. Medicaid is a really important one. That's the focus of this study. DEMAS and also the federal government will give grants to behavioral health clinics to support non-Medicaid members or things that Medicaid won't cover. Um, that's outside the scope of the study. Really here we're focusing on Medicaid members for Medicaid covered services at providers who, who, who take Medicaid. And if it would be useful, we can provide, we have looked at the behavioral health um, landscape more generally beyond the clinics, which kind of, the, the, the clinic is spiking out. We, we spiked it up partly because that's the way they're billing, partly also because we thought there was a big disparity there and um, it was worth highlighting that. We can provide in writing, if it would be useful, a more comprehensive view of the BH landscape across the board. M um, some of the other BH rates are not as low as the behavioral health clinic. Um, there, so I'm happy to provide that in writing. I don't have those numbers for you right now, but I could follow up if you saw. But so a not, but so a private provider can work within the behavioral health clinic. Just to be clear, by, by private provider, do you mean a psychiatrist or what? What do you, what do you mean, or a psychologist? Or? So I guess the so the behavioral health clinic isn't an entity; it's a type of service. It's a it is an entity. It is an entity. Yeah. And so when we looked at, when you all looked at that code in particular, do the behavioral health clinics treat folks outside of Medicaid? 
They do. They do. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. But 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 the, this rate study. Yes. I, 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 um, yeah. We're, we're we're we only have the data for for Medicaid, so we don't know, for example, what commercial um, are paying or um, other other insurers. Okay. And in the recommendation section for behavioral health, yep. mm -hmm. it speaks to using an independent rate model and a provider survey. Can you speak more to that? What that would look like? Sure. And I, I guess I would say more generally. And I just want to put a little bit of distance between the the study authors and, and what we're recommending. Not not too much, but just a little bit. Um, we, I think it is clear from these results that they be able to clinic. There, there's there's some big discrepancy. We want to talk with them. Um, we want to talk with members and advocates. Uh, we do want to recognize that they do receive funding from other sources. So we want to kind of get that more comprehensive picture. Um, and that's the the six weeks of stakeholdering that the commissioner was mentioning. And Bill, do I, I get everything right? Okay, great, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, great, I think next up we have a question from Representative Hughes, uh, followed thank by you. Senator Anwar. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Guy, uh, I, for the whole thing. And I really, really appreciate that you're accelerating the stakeholder engagement because of the urgent crisis we're, we're facing and given the session time so that we can really implement some some measures to address this, uh, you know, these disparities. Um, two, my two questions, I, and again, I appreciate this and being part of MAPOC, I'm sure we're going to also cycle in. One is, um, you mentioned something about the autism services disparity. Is that due to the age of the, the person with autism? Is that one of the major disparities? Did I hear that somewhere along the line? Representative, thanks for that question. We really need to dig in to the autism section a bit more. So mm -hmm. um, just taking a step back, most autism services are not covered by Medicare. So this is one of the ones where we're, we're looking to the to the five states, the, the five peer states. And we found, or the, the study authors found that as a state per, per person on Medicaid, we're spending substantially more on autism, although the rates are lower on average, just a little surprising. We wanna dig into that and better understand what's driving that. It doesn't necessarily mean that the other states are right and we're wrong. So we're certainly not saying that. Um, it just was a bit of an outlier. Uh, and so that's one of the things we wanna dig into now that we have the data to do so. Okay, great. And and my second question is, um, with the five peer states, are there other states that are keeping up with their rates better because they're doing a, a, a rate study more frequently? Are they adjusting to CPI? What? How, how are we falling so bar far behind and what what would the author study and your recommendations be to keep this from happening so I think forward? one of the I'm sorry I did not mean to interrupt you I apologize I think one of the uh, strongest recommendations from this study is that Connecticut engage in a thoughtful planful regular review of its rates so that is what the so the five states that we chose we felt were the close the, the ones that were most closely aligned to us in terms of socio economic status in terms of size in terms of population geography there are a number of factors that we chose that are all uh, outlined in the report but the the one factor that was that was common among all of them is that they did build in a regular rate review and that and to Guy's point earlier and the reason why I think why the legislature very wisely decided to uh, to implement this, to ask us to implement the study, is that we have not had that approach. And we can see the results of that, right, in, in the, the significant disparities and changes and differences, even among codes within the same provider type. Other states have avoided that, even if they don't make adjustments to uh, provider rates year over year, they at least have a very strong sense of where the trends are, where their needs might might be shifting, depending on aging populations, more children that are born with special needs. And a regular review allows us to make a, and I keep using the same term, but a more planful approach as to how we provide those those provider types. Now, I will say this, we are in a state where I, I'm, the AARP may slap me, but more, I'll just, I won't use the number, but more people turn 60 every day in this state than in, than in most states in, in, the, in the nation. And that means then that for Medicaid and our members, that might mean that we're making a shift but if we are simply responding to, uh, you know, if we don't, let me say it differently, if we don't have a comprehensive planful approach to rate setting, then we're not also taking into consideration the, the trends and the needs of the members that we are serving as we are determining what's, what is happening. 
Other states also align their rate reviews with their biennial budgets so that they can understand what the fiscal impact might be of making a rate change. And if they are going to make a change, they then know how much of a change would be possible or if any change would be possible at all. They also then determine which codes, depending on the changes within their, uh, their own environments, they might want to sunset and others that they actually might want to encourage more providers to provide more services within in order to meet uh, policy initiatives, but more importantly, to meet the needs of the members. These are all of the reasons why doing this study is really critical. And we would really encourage, a, uh, at least as one of the recommendations, a, a recommendation of a regular review of rates for that purpose. Thank you. This is so helpful, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I wanted to first thank uh, the Human Services Committee for your leadership uh, and also thank the Commissioner and Guy for being here to discuss uh, this report. Um, I was anticipating the report to be uh, what it is, but not as bad as it is in, in some respects. So I just uh, um, also want to thank you for um, looking at this and, and, and recognizing that we have a lot of work to do. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, it's, it's, we have been through public health committee in the last uh, year or two years, we've been trying to figure out the workforce issue we have been working on compacts. Every year we are trying to put some ways of increasing the personnel in our state from healthcare management. And I think people are at times in various areas that uh, the numbers are showing, for example, for behavioral health and, and other areas, they have actually um, been leaving our state and now we're trying to figure out how can we get them back. Um, so addressing this would be a priority. The question I have is, what can we do with this study? And, and if we were to increase the rates, how much support can the federal government provide us so that the burden on our budget is going to be not as much? Senator, thank you for that question. Um, it's a really thoughtful one. Um, and I'm going to say a couple of things I know you know, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, because not everyone's as familiar with Medicaid as you are. Um, Medicaid is a joint federal state program. Uh, where the feds in general pay 50 cents on the dollar. So for every dollar that we spend, they, they pay 50 cents. However, there are, um, they pay more than that in some cases. So for example, for the Medicaid expansion portion under Obamacare, the ACA, they pay 90 cents on the dollar. For family planning services, they pay 90 cents on the dollar. For some technology build, 75% on the dollar. Um, overall, so the answer is, I just want to give that background because it depends a little bit on the services that we pick. But overall, um, we think uh, the state in general and average, and again, will depend a little bit on on, on the the service category. But forty cents on the forty cents on the dollar. So for every for every dollar of rates, on average, the state will pay forty cents and the feds will pay sixty cents. Again, that will vary a little bit. So for example, a service that disproportionately is used by the Obamacare expansion population, the state share will be lower. Um, portions uh, services that are disproportionately used by other populations, the state share will be higher. But in general, forty cents in the dollar is a good um, a, a good uh, number to keep in mind, and that, that that's automatic. So, um, you know, if, if we move forward and spend that seven million state share, that will that will go um, th that 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 that's more than seven million. That'll be sixteen, whatever whatever seven divided by point four is. Um, uh, uh, um, of, of impact on the rates. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, if I may ask my second question. You may. Um, uh, I, I think um, I would not be surprised if we see similar results uh, in the remaining, the phase two of the study. But when we have uh, limited resources, we have to um, make sure that we have allocation uh, strategies in mind. Um, is it too early for us to have conversation on um, year one, year two, year three of allocation assessment and improvement and, and budgeting uh, requests uh, internally from the DSS? Thank you for your question, Senator. It, it may be too early to speak specifically about dollar amounts, but it is not too early for us to start considering what methodologies we might want to employ when, when we are setting rates. 
the report does provide for four different types of methodologies, uh, and then it focuses in more specifically on two of them. So the one method, the, the two that they focus on specifically are lowering rates in some areas, but depending on the benchmark that a state chooses and then raising them in, in other provider types. And then the other is to leave certain provider types where they are and then raise rates where you feel that you need to have a greater impact or to the Senator's point, there might be access issues or there's a significant disparity between what we pay uh, as compared to other states, particularly as based on the results of this, of, of this uh, rate study. So I, what we're doing internally really right now is just looking at the recommendations that, that uh, the, uh, the study authors have made with respect to which, if any, of all of the recommendations they've made uh, regarding a, a process that we should use would be most applicable in this circumstance. There are some pros and cons to all of them, of course. There is, we can clearly know now that, that lowering rates on one end and raising them on the other is certainly not going to be a popular decision. We, we just know that. Uh, but we, also, but it may not be popular to leave certain rates where they are because to the Senator's point, there might be sure perceptions that those rates are insufficient as they currently exist. And so rate, leaving some where they are and then raising others may also be an inappropriate use of, uh, it may be an inappropriate process to address the concerns that we have and to create more access and more parity in the way that rates are set. So to your point, it is not too soon. We've actually already begun to have many of these discussions internally about, well, you know, what, what should we be thinking about? And that's why the stakeholder process is so important because we can think about what we think is important internally at DSS. And we certainly we have a lot of experience and we, had, uh, we have a lot of information and even more so now with this rate study. But what we also need to know is how any change that we make or any process or processes that we choose would affect our members and affect our providers and affect the communities that they serve. So no, it is definitely not too early to think about that, even if we're not prepared to discuss the potential fiscal impact, the process is really critical and we've already started those discussions. Thank you for your leadership, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and so uh, in, I don't mean to take a step backwards in the process, but looking again at the, the methodology uh, of the study, um, I know this is not true for all provider types, but for many, um, there's a bit of a, a zero sum game in Connecticut in terms of payment mix. Uh, and so um, while it's less than likely that a provider is going to uh, hightail it to New York or Massachusetts or New Jersey because of a low Medicaid reimbursement rate, uh, it is entirely possible that they could adjust their payment mix to uh, Medicare or to commercial payers. But you didn't look at commercial pay types. And wouldn't that, wouldn't that have helped us sort of suss out potential access issues with, you know, looking at, at that data to see if, what the discrepancy is and why was that? <laughs> Why was that excluded? And maybe that's our fault for not specifically charging you with that. I So thank you, Senator. I, I wouldn't necessarily um, place any blame or fault in terms of not including commercial. Well, that's a relief. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Uh, actually, I think it was actually quite prudent to uh, not include commercial as part of the analysis because it really allowed us in the very short period of time we had to really focus on the, on the critical issue of the parity around Medicaid rates as compared to Medicare. Commercial rates have uh, you know, quite a, 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 a more than a fair degree of variability. So I think it's actually quite wise to limit the comparison to Medicare, to Guy's point, because Medicare is a process that actually has a specific way in which it can determine what the rates are. So that actually allowed us to create a universe in which we could do some comparability. The second thing is, just from a policy perspective, the, the purpose of Medicaid, as we know, is really not to be in a race to the end with commercial rates, right? We're really looking at, and, and all providers know this, so a comparison to commercial rates isn't necessarily one that would be feasible, quite frankly, right, with every budgetary constraint that every state has. It's not just us. And it, it also, in many ways, I think would, would skew what we're trying to accomplish here, which is to try to create Medicaid rate comparability with other states, because that really is what the, the major concern is that most providers raise, is that the rates aren't high enough, this, this is what we're hearing anecdotally, to meet the needs of the people that we're serving. And we think that your rates, Connecticut, aren't necessarily as comparable to other states. So the, I, I really do believe quite strongly uh, because this is quite a debate in, internally, but I think we've all come to agree that the that 
in phase one and in phase two that limiting the universe to Medicare and to the five states that are comparable was the appropriate way in which to frame this analysis. I not at all. Completely agree with it, Commissioner. Maybe just two other two other quick points. Um, we followed the statute, um, uh, and, and I think that was partly practical. The commissioner mentioned this, we had very little time to to do it, and so practically we needed to focus on what you asked us to do. But then maybe just expanding on the commissioner's point as well, commercial rates tend to be higher. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but in general, uh, Medicare uses its big buying authority to to say, here are the rates, take it or leave it. And as a consequence, they get better rates. You know, people, I'm not making a political statement, but people who favor single payer, you know, this is an argument that, that, that they use. Um, Medicaid in Connecticut, we're kind of in a similar situation. We're insuring a million people. We're, we're large. We do have market power. Uh, uh, our friends at OHS could correct, could fact check me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel pretty sure that um, the median commercial payer in Connecticut has nowhere near a million members. They pay higher rates, and that's not good. But um, but let's use our let's use the market power that we do have. It's the closest thing to a single payer that we have here in the state of Connecticut. And I, I really do think Medicaid and Medicare are the more appropriate um, comparisons, exactly as the commissioner was saying. Okay, and if I could. Uh give myself uh, another follow-up, and I do have a couple of members who are waiting to ask questions, so I'll try to control myself. Um, but uh, just with regard to pediatric um, coverage, my understanding is that um, kids who are uh, categorically needing covered uh, are entitled to early and pe uh, periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment benefits. Um, and that applies regardless of whether or not a service is covered expressly by the state plan. Um, and so I'm just wondering if if the department thinks that, you know, in light of the data released by this study, if that might entitle kids to uh, a faster uh, rate uh, increase uh, sort of beyond the whatever we're able to do legislatively. Does, do you see that as something that could potentially uh, apply here? And if, yeah. It's, it's, that's not usually conversational to turn a mic on. So I, was, I wasn't really thinking about that. Uh, it, you, you pose a very interesting uh, question, Senator. We hadn't really focused very specifically on access to pediatric care. I think in large measure because the uh, the rate difference that we saw in behavioral health just spoke to us so loudly that we hadn't really focused on that. So what I really like to do is to take that back a bit because we haven't really had an opportunity to discuss that I think substantively enough to answer your question here today, if you don't mind. Absolutely fair. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, I know that uh, Representative Dillon has her hand up online. Okay. She's not here. Okay. okay. Well, I'm, I'm there, sort of. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you for your hard work, Commissioner. Um, I guess uh, I just want to ask a couple of clarifying questions. Uh, for the record, and that is like a, on the behavioral, which does comport with my experience on the ground, by the way, but uh, not new actually, going back quite a while. Uh, to, when you define behavioral health clinic and we're going forward to craft a remedy to the problem, would we have a number of providers in our area, for example, that serve a, a, a lot of uninsured uninsurable uh, and Medicaid people, and and also a number of providers that sort of opted out in other towns and don't take Medicaid at all. I'm curious what how big the universe is. Uh, for example, we have two community health centers in, in, uh, in our town. Would they be included in any remedy that you're looking at? So uh, thank you, Representative. Yes. So as Guy had explained uh, before, the behavioral health clinics do have a very specific almost uh, a term of art associated with them. So the, we would be looking at all of the behavioral health clinics, and that would include those that would be within your district that are covered under this rate study for Medicaid. But I think the question you're asking me, though, is somewhat different. And that is, if if we come back with a recommendation regarding rate increases, would it include the clinics in your town and the 
the answer to that is I think so if if that is the decision that is eventually made and your clinic is covered under those that would that would eventually see a rate change as a result of this study, then yes, that would be the case. Thank you. I mean, we have a, a range of, and my apologies to the chairman for a minute, but we have a range of providers and supportive housing, and uh, there were a number of policy decisions made by the previous administration to cut uh, the, the rates that included clinicians, and there were a number of providers that had to do what they call reductions in force. So it definitely affects access. And, and I haven't circled back to talk to anyone about this since, since I've seen the document, but um, I, I think it's salutary. I, I don't know what the legislature will do with it. But um, my second question um, involves autism. Um, and that is, if, since you're comparing to Medicare, did you feel that you had enough? It, it looks counterintuitive to me to the result here on, on the autism spectrum to what I've been hearing on the ground. And I wonder, um, since you're comparing to Medicare, did you have enough data points over time to feel that you had a, a, a decent comparison? I think, yeah. Representative, thank you so much for your question. Um, on autism, just to um, just to clarify, so um, ac across the whole board, we first looked to Medicare for the reasons I outlined. There's the, the comprehensive rate study, the, the ROC, things like that. When there wasn't a match to Medicare, we looked to Medicaid to those five states. So the autism services are one of those cases where uh, there, uh, there was not a good match to Medicare. And so we were looking to Medicaid to the, the five states, Massachusetts, Maine, New York, New Jersey, and Oregon. Um, and there was good uh, match and overlap. If, if you give me one moment, I'll. I think that's table one in the um, table one in the report. Uh, Eighty-nine percent of the dollars in the autism bucket had a match to those uh, those five states. And you can see in table one in the report, there there is not. There's just the blue bar, not the green bar. Um, that's saying there wasn't a match to Medicare for all the reasons you really point out. Instead, there was a match to to Medicaid, and that's. That's what we're we're doing the comparison there. A figure two. Thank sorry. you very much. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Gus. Thank you, uh, Representative uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation and work. Much appreciated. Um, a question on how you develop the rates that you compared. Uh, with the other states. We have the states divided into sections A, B, and C. Uh, did did you just combine all the rates that we uh, provide the reimbursement on? Uh, I just wondered how that was done. And if we go to, uh, once we come up with the final analysis, will we get rid of the A, B, C uh, designations for the regions uh, in terms of the reimbursement rates for our providers? Great question, Representative. Uh, and I'm looking to Nicole, my colleague. So if I say something wrong, please jump in. Uh, for for phase one, we do. Um, th there are not regional rates. Uh, yeah, the, the services covered in phase one. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, the rates are are set the same across the the state. Um, so that's not a bridge we've thought about for phase one. In phase two, uh, we have not fully thought through what we will do, but in part to make sure phase two, which again is covering four fifths of the program, so it's four times bigger, um, to make sure the report is not 10,000 pages, we'll probably pick something that focuses on the average rate, and then we'll probably have some commentary around regional variation um, there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll provide commentary on, on my thoughts uh, as we move forward. But uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I think you answered it already, but I, I'm gonna apply the autism question to the dental issue. Uh, because I think that, as you know, Medicare generally does not pay for dental, but the Advantage plans, which are private plans that are not really insurance, they're, they're um, <clears throat> insurance at all, they're just private, uh, you know, trusts. Uh, did you utilize any of those or did you just stay with comparing the uh, rates with the other states, the other Medicaid states? 
we stayed with just a comparison of the Medicaid rates in the other states. And, and that is, it's for two reasons. The, the most important of which I think is that it gave us the greatest degree of comparison that was comparable. That was one of the reasons that we did that. And also be thinking about the states that we did choose, as I mentioned before, and their comparability, I think allowed us to do within the time frame to, to produce the results that we needed to within the time frame that we had, that we thought would really produce useful results that we could make some really reasons, uh, thoughtful decisions around with respect to the rates that we pay, rates that other states pay within certain provider groups. There, there are already 11,000 codes that have been <laughs> Right, that have been analyzed in this report alone. Uh, so at some point we did have to make some decisions about what the, the universe of comparable rates of comparability would be and how we would do that. And that some of the decisions that we made were really just very practical ones. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank and you. I, just would, I, would, sorry, I would just really briefly add to the commissioner's point, the same point I made earlier on policy-wise, Medicare fee-for-service Medicaid, they do have the size, the rate-setting authority that they do. The MA plans don't, particularly in something like dental where it's an optional service. It, um, my understanding is that MA plans will sometimes cover dental, sometimes they won't. They will, can pick and choose on what services, some preventative, some not. It's a real checkered board of what they cover, and they're not also using their, their size and scale to set competitive rates. Well, let me just follow up with a question now that you've raised another issue. <laughs> <laughs> but a quick a quick question uh, uh, is uh, so uh, the dental is uh, defined in the Medicare plan, uh, so it's just taking care of teeth. But if you had an abscess, as was described today, for Medicaid purposes and even for Medicare purposes, uh, that would be covered. Uh, any type of structural problem with with how the bone is, uh, temporal mandibular joint syndrome, for example would be one of the things that Medicare would cover because it's it's a medical issue as opposed to a dental issue. Does the Medicaid program in this circumstance uh, make the distinction between medical versus dental? Thanks, Representative, great question. Um, here in Connecticut, we offer a comp in, in Medicaid, we offer a comprehensive dental package for both children and adults. Many states do not offer uh, adult dental um, benefits under the Medicaid program, um, and and we we do we do not make that distinction uh, that that Medicare does, and I think for good reasons. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Representative Gilchrist. Great, thank you. Um, moving to the the physician outpatient Husky Health primary care anesthesia radiology surgery fee schedules. Um, there's the authors recommended that another kind of low hanging fruit might be to um, adjust services with a methodology based on a percent of Medicare first. And so was hoping you could speak through um, kind of that difference between how they're paid versus maybe the value based payment. Like, so why, why would we separate out the various provider types within that category? Well, there are several reasons why we would do that, right? First, the, the first of which is that there are significant differences between uh, those just called strict fee-for-service and value-based payments. And some of the states that were uh, comparison states used a very different model to provide rates and reimbursement under a value-based, I can't say it, a value-based payment model versus a fee-for-service model. So that breakout really is important because there's not necessarily a rate-for-rate a -rate comparability when you try to compare this because value-based payments really are designed to do exactly as they're described. And that isn't necessary. So that we're looking for different outcomes and incentives sometimes are built into value-based payments that would not necessarily be built into a fee-for-service model. So that's one of the reasons that there's the significant distinction, right? The other is that sometimes there are times when providers would prefer to be in a value-based payment model because of the, the the patients that they serve and because of where they are and that they necessarily want to have a different way in which they are reimbursed than fee-for-service. And sometimes they want to combine the fee-for-service and the value-based payment, depending on who it is that they're serving. I know this because we are actually engaging in primary care payment reform. And this is one of the many, many discussions that we have is the how do you design this model? So that's one of the reasons that we separate it. And I can turn it over to Guy to, to add more commentary and color to that. 100% agree with everything the commissioner said. Um, Maybe just taking a, a half step back, Rep Kilcrest, um, I think part of the 
the reasons the study authors recommended when there's a Medicare match tying to Medicare is just there is this there is this robust process. I, I alluded to it briefly, but just 30 more seconds on it. They um the, the, this committee comprehensively meets, looks at the rates, updates them at least every five years more if there's been a substantive change, thinks about the physician costs, the office costs, the malpractice costs. Um, it's a robust process. And you know, in principle, Connecticut could replicate that ourselves. It's a significant administrative cost and overhead and probably doesn't make sense. Like why, 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 why reinvent the wheel? Like, you know, what, why not, why not um, piggyback on a process that, that Medicare is, is doing? I think the study authors recommended a fixed percent of Medicare simply recommend re realizing the budget realities that we may, we may not be able to pay X percent of, uh, of Medicare, you know, 180, whatever the percent is. Um, and so I think the study authors were saying, look, we get it. There, there, there's their budget constraints, but pick a number, and then you don't have. If you remember that that histogram I showed of all the variation around the average, you know, the average was sixty five, but somewhere at twenty five, somewhere at one hundred, somewhere at under twenty five. You know, like the, I think the study authors were, were kind of saying, bring that, bring that to a, a single number, and that could be set based on budget constraints and, and others. But you know, get rid of some of the the variation. I think your question on value based payments is a really good one. The one thing I'll just add, very much agree with everything the commissioner said. Many, many times when you're setting a value-based payment, for example, in the maternity bundle, the rates that we're paying the the we will pay the OBs when we launch are informed by what we would have paid them under a fee-for-service schedule. So even if we, um, okay, maternity is not a good example because Medicare doesn't cover many maternity services, um, the population, but. In primary care, for example, mm. even even if we uh, adopt a value based payment, it still is informative and illustrative to say what would Medicare have paid for a similar set of services, and I think that's what the study authors were getting at with that recommendation. Thank you. That's helpful. And then a second question um, back to dental. That's been brought up quite a bit, um, and I spoke with you about this privately, but I thought it would be helpful for folks because um, when we're <sighs> The report, you know, on its face makes it seem like dental is doing fairly well compared to the other states. Um, but in speaking with folks that in the field, that's not their experience. So would it be helpful? And is there a way to be able to get the 174 codes? Now, I wouldn't do this, but have someone else do it. Um, get those 174 codes uh, that were for the adults and 186 for the pediatric to understand like would utilization play into this? So with those various codes, and as you mentioned, you know, we we know there's the the average, but some codes are higher, some codes are lower. Did you already break down the utilization? So which codes are being used most in dental? And do, are those some of the lower codes? You know, some of the lower reimbursed codes? So I... And, and, and Guy is looking up the data, but I, I will tell you that we didn't not we didn't necessarily engage in that level of granularity. So what we did is we asked the study authors to look at codes that are actually being used. So there may be some that have very low utilization and some that have extremely high utilization. And because but if a code was being used, we asked them to compare that to another state that did actually have uh, a similar or in many instances the same code that also had utilization there is there is a chart i think that's the one that he was looking for that actually breaks down what the utilization codes and the percentage of the code as compared to um, our state and he, he has that that's what he was looking for so i just was com yeah, completely okay. agree if you heard me wrestling papers i, know it I, I was pulling up um yes so that histogram representative that i i showed uh, i think we picked um, physician, the, the first histogram I showed showed that variation. We actually, in the report itself, we have that same data for all of the nine categories. So table six, it's a long report. Pa table six on page 23 has that, that same breakdown um, for dental, both adult and separately for pediatrics, because we because I know, you know there's a lot of interest in those two separate populations. And so I'll just read a single line of it just to just to interpret. So the, the line that says 75 to 99% of comparison um, on the adult side, that's 24%. And on the pediatric side, 13%. What that's saying is dollar weighted, weighted by utilization, 24% of the codes are between 75 and 99% of the, the, the five state. So you can see there, there is, there is real variation 
Th that, that picture that I showed, kind of finding number two, that there's variation within each category, that is true for every single one of the nine. Um, nine groups and and um in the report itself it, it has that breakdown for for each of the nine thank you thank you very much oh we thank you uh representative um uh have some uh folks who have their hands up for the second time uh, before i go to them um uh, just are there other folks members of the committees who have questions who have not asked questions for a first time okay um then I have a just a, a, another follow up question about uh, pediatric coverage. Um, I know that in some cases the state offers separate pediatric um, and adult rates. Uh, I know we did that for complex care. We currently do that for dental care. Did the study attempt to disaggregate pediatric and adult rates? I didn't see that in the write up, but I didn't know if that was something that was. Yes, Senator. Yes. Thanks for the Thank question. So, um, yes, for example, in dental, where where Table Six shows the shows the comparison, uh, for complex complex here was not not covered in Phase One. That'll be coming in Phase Two. Um, for pediatric, just for example, like a pediatric PCP visit with sure. an adult, those are different codes, mm -hmm. and so there's a built in there's a built in um, comparison, uh, kind of comparing peds to peds and and adults to adults there. Other than dental and other than the case where they're they're different, like they're different codes in the CPT codes, we did not break it up separately for children and adults. Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I got that right. Great, thank you. No, the only place that we did that was in with was within dental, and that is the same uh, chart. I was just looking for it again, and it's Table Six, where we have it broken down. And that's just dental, but I think you're asking about primary care or no? Uh, just dental. No, I, I also primary care for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, with that we did not do that for primary care. It was broken down for dental. Okay. Um, and I have a somewhat difficult question. So we knew last spring when we were negotiating the budget that uh, the funding allocated was not going to be sufficient. We had an inkling that it was not going to be sufficient to, but that it would make hopefully make a, a dent. Um, and we did allocate. We had seven million dollars that was unallocated in the governor's budget. We also had several allocated Medicaid increases. The governor's proposed budget has proposed to rescind those allocations, including for ambulance services. Um, and that obviously is a policy call that we're going to work out through the appropriations process. But I, I'm curious, and I, you know, I know you're not OPM, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts about why those funds weren't at least redirected into the, you know, they, they were swept into the overall general fund. They weren't reallocated to, you know, pay for the increases here, the unallocated increase. And I just didn't know if there was a, a, a rationale for that or, or what, because that, you know, every, every dollar counts. And, you know, that was uh, in the case of Medicaid rating, uh, for, uh, ambulance rates, that's, I think that was $5 million uh, that could have gone uh, to physician specialists, behavioral health care that, that we don't see here reflected before us. So, Senator, I just I'm I'm wondering if we're just um, combining those two issues and they're not necessarily uh, with I think maybe within the same realm. So uh, yesterday, uh, if you recall, I did testify with respect to the ambulance uh, rates and the fact that the rates had gone up uh, 10 percent in 2021. And that would that was the rate itself. And then they had a significant increase in in the mileage. The governor's budget does, in fact, recommend that those rates be held steady and that this, the second increase that was the 20 percent increase that was supposed to occur in 2025 actually uh, not occur because we are living well within the fiscal guardrails that the, that the governor and the secretary have both spoken about. Uh, and you are absolutely right. I am not OPM, so I cannot speak to reallocation or, or any other decisions uh, of that nature. But uh, we do have the resources that we have, and the governor has, in fact, because we did have a one-time spend uh, that uh, hit to our Medicaid budget, that the governor has then reallocated other resources so that our Medicaid budget can remain whole and we can continue to deliver those services. So while that particular pocket of money I can really can't speak to, I can tell you that we have made other changes. And as I mentioned yesterday in our appropriations hearing, there are other upward adjustments that have been made to our budget to meet utilization. Uh, so for example, we know that the utilization uh, in Husky B for un, uh, undocumented children 
there was, I think it was Senator pa uh, Representative Paris that had asked, uh, what about the $14 million? It looked like there was a $14 million cut. That program actually has much more participation than we had anticipated. So we did get an opportunity to have a, an increase that reflected that because, and again, it's a reflection of, of the policy uh, that we want to support all children in the state. And so now that is within our Medicaid budget. It looks like it's a decrease, but it's actually just moved to another SID. So th while that might not, while I can't speak directly to what you specifically asked, there have been adjustments that have been made within the governor's budget that does in, in fact uh, appropriately support our, our Medicaid members. And, and I appreciate that. And I, you know, uh, speaking personally, I, I did notice that and uh, appreciate the governor uh, and the OPM uh, uh, office of OPM uh, working to, you know, maintain our current services and, and the policies that we agreed on in the state. Um, just in terms of access, I, again, I, I don't mean to harp on this, this, the, the uh, you know, what's not in the report, uh, but um, is there a way to, uh, are there recent reports? I know that you, the department engages in, um, you know, monitors, uh, providers who report uh, accepting Medicaid, and then he also engages in secret shoppers to maintain. Do you have a recent report looking at physician specialists on behavioral health care, on dentists, to sort of see if we can match up the the rate issue with uh, re with our best understanding of the number of providers in each category who accept Medicaid? Mm -hmm. Well, I I can start if you have my yeah. So. Uh, Okay. <laughs> Senator, we go ahead and we'll have some more, some more distractions. That's okay. It's a Thursday afternoon. No, no we're, we're perfectly fine. Uh, I, so we, we use the many of the, tools some of us were here until two o'clock in the morning. So we're, we're rolling a little. <laughs> I gave up watching at 1230. I'm like, I just, because I knew I'd be here today. I'm like, I, at some point I have to be lucid for, for today's uh, proceedings. So uh, we use the secret shopper and the other tools that you mentioned for a number of reasons. They are primarily quality tools to make sure that members do have access. So if we do have providers that are making decisions as to whether or not they're going to provide care because of um, a member happens to be a Medicaid member, that is those secret shopper and the other tools that are, they're very specific. And yes, we do get regular reports and actually uh, the person who manages our relationships with our with our providers and our third party administrator who manages our relationship with our providers is Fatmata Williams. And she is on top of that every single day. So we, we actually know what's going on. So if we see that there is a trend with a particular provider or in a particular group, that is something that we do bring back and we address. We do it specifically by provider and we do it by provider type. And if there is an access issue, not necessarily related to rates, but also related to transportation, to the number of providers in an area, that information allows us to be able to pivot. In some instances, we can do more. And in some instances, we have to give our members more options as to where they might be able to go as an alternative. We have not really had a chance to, to dig very deeply into the idea of whether or not the, the rates provide a barrier to access, but we know this anecdotally and we hear this from our members that there could be providers that are making decisions as to whether or not they can add to their, well, be a member of our panel or add to the number of patients that they see that, that are Medicaid patients because the rates are not sufficient. And, and we do know that. But what I think you're asking us is, can we move from the anecdotal observation to a more specific observation? And we can we can try to do that, knowing that there is there is a fair degree of difficulty in doing that. If CMS can't do it, we can give it a, a good college try. But I'm not necessarily sure we're going to be any more successful. But it, there we may be able to do that within a specific rate. But I I don't necessarily want to sit here today and promise you that. But it it. See, getting this rate study has really allowed us to determine where we can focus more purposefully, where we believe that more than anecdotally, there there may be access issues that we can address in a different way. Thank you. Um, Senator Anwar. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, for Commissioner and, and, and Guy, um, depending on the pair mix of the various healthcare system, University of Connecticut being on the top, Yukon Healthcare Center. Um, if is is there a way for somebody to do the assessment um, that if the Medicaid rates were at market level, um, perhaps ninety percent of Medicare, um, 
that would reduce the uh, budget uh, shortfalls at University of Connecticut and many of the hospitals that the state is helping, um, would that get fixed? In other words, we are thinking of adjusting the budget, we are paying one way or the other. So my, my thought is that if we were paying the right amount because these uh, hospitals are seeing disproportionate number of Medicaid patients, uh, we will be not paying them um, through helping them through the other means. So just a thought uh, for us to consider as, as we are paying no matter what. That makes sense. Yes. Were you, were you, did you want a response, Senator? I'm not sure if you were. Yeah. If, 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 you, if, if there was some, is there a way to assess that? Is there a way to look at this? Because that would help us yes. um, make the decision. Otherwise, the solution will take multiple years. But if we calculate this right, we would be able to say, you know what? There's a way to fix this uh, by paying the right amount from the beginning. Certainly. Well, thank you for the question, Senator. As we know that we are in, we are under a settlement agreement with the hospitals right now that really sets the rates that we are paying. And so that agreement is still in place. And I would want to be respectful of that agreement in the response that I give you. We did not in the context of this rate study or any other contemplate uh, a review of those of those rates. Uh, in the, we didn't go through all of the slides that I provided yesterday in the appropriations, but the hospitals, and if you don't mind, I'm actually going to get the number. I'm not going to speak out of turn. Thank you. I appreciate your patience while I get the information so that I, not, that I don't misspeak. I would, I'm looking, what I'm looking for as we are looking is the percentage of the payments that our Medicaid uh, budget is for hospitals. So our general overall budget for Medicaid is 73% of our budget. And then let me find actually the, our hospital number, right? So hospitals are 30.3% of our overall Medicaid budget, but that does not include, and they are the largest share of our Medicaid spend at 30%. There are other categories in which we spend, and they include long-term care, uh, pharmacy and clinics, uh, and other kinds of medical support. That does not include, however, any supplemental payments that we make to hospitals, and that is not part of our Medicaid budget. We do have what we call a state sub plan that we provide to hospitals as well. We have not engaged in an analysis if, if that would uh, answer the question or at least try to pose some answers to the question, if we raise the Medicaid rate, would that in fact close a budgetary uh, uh, deficit as you've described it so that we could find a different way to compensate hospitals? That is not something that we've engaged in, but I can certainly take that, that back and have that discussion with our OPM partners, but that, isn't, that is not part of what has been happening with this rate study or, with, uh, or under the settlement agreement with the hospitals, which again, I really do want to respect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could, could you provide to the committees um, a 10-year look back at the number of providers in each provider type? that are participating in the Medicaid program. So we could, I, I know that that data may be dangerous in various respects, but uh, could give us some sense of how access issues have been impacted. And I understand that that may not be entirely driven by rates and I don't want to. A few things have happened in the last 10 years that could that could, that could be at play. So uh, all the caveats you need to provide, is that, some, is that information that you have? Is that all provider type, Senator? Um, or within the provider types covered by phase one of okay. the study? I'm not certain. We can okay. check. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Dillon for the second time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I wanted to follow up on dental. Uh, have you looked at the, uh, at the category of extractions at all? I'm not certain if if extractions is one of the provider codes that we followed. I don't know. Do do you do you have any idea whether or not it is? I think I think it is, Representative. I'm not 100% sure. 
um, I'll look through the study while, while, while my boss answers the, your tough questions, but. Uh. Well, I, I mentioned that just because uh, in meeting with some people in organized dentistry and also with uh, uh, individuals in, in New Haven, I've heard some disturbing reports of very young people, I thought, well, under 40, getting extractions because they could not afford procedures. And it would seem to me if you're 30 years old and you're having an extraction, that's a dramatic thing to do. And uh, and I wonder if we could look at that going forward. Uh, that's a little bit outside the scope of what your study was, although it is, frankly, an access issue to me. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to leave that concern there about extractions as a, a point indicator of lack of access because of, of financial considerations or eligibility. And, and uh, also I've been informed by several people since my last question that FQHCs are in phase two. And so uh, uh, one of the great things about cells is that we keep getting information as we're, as we're uh, about our laptops, I'm sorry, is that we keep getting information as we're, as we're in process. So I did want to mention that, but I am concerned about dental access and uh, I appreciate your presentation on that today. Here, Representative, just a quick non-answer. Um, uh, I Your question on extractions, I am quite certain, but not 100% sure that extractions were one of the 174 on the adult and 186 on the pediatric uh, that were included. Certainly it's a key part of the program. Uh, we can follow up with you to confirm that fact. And then we can also follow up with a comparison for the extraction codes where they were relative to the to the five states. That'll basically on table six that looks at where we are relative to the um, the five Medicaid states. Uh, extractions is somewhere in there, um, and I can just highlight where where that is. Um, we can take that as a follow up. Thank you. And, and uh, that my concern was that extraction might be a point indicator of lack of adequate access if you're having an extraction at a young age because you don't have coverage. Uh, and I, I don't know the range of, of plans or providers that would be included. Uh, sometimes when someone is telling you a story, you don't necessarily drill down uh, to ask all of those specific questions and they may not even know uh, if, it's a, if it's a patient, but it is something that has come up a lot in the last two years with young people and it troubles me a bit. Thank you. Representative, are you, are you done? Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I am. Well, oh, okay. not, not really, I've never done, but, but the, specifically to this question, I am, and I appreciate your courtesy. We, we met only in respect to your questioning, that's all. Uh, uh, Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Senator. Um, back to autism. So the autism spectrum disorder. Um, the author in their in the author's recommendations, they discuss determining whether policy changes are needed to address utilization of some of the ASD rates. Could you speak to that? Why did they highlight that? Thanks for your question, Representative. Um, and I am, uh, I'm also going to look to Bill. So if I say anything wrong or Bill, I may bring you up here. Um, it really goes back to what I highlighted earlier. Um, on a per member basis, our total spending was substantially higher than the other states, but the rates were lower, um, which is, which is surprising. I mean, it, it just a little, a little puzzling. Um, they have not, and we didn't ask them, we didn't, we didn't pay them to dig in on why that might be the case or what um, what preventative services or what support services we may or may not be giving people that may cause that pattern. And more was just a, a striking observation that the, the rates were low, but the total spending is higher than than the other states. And it's a place we need to dig in more. Um, I, I don't, we have not done that digging yet, right? The report's only been out for um, a, a handful of days, um, but it's really that, it's really that, that point. And I think that review could look like, for example, Thinking about the range of services that we offer relative to to um, our peer states, thinking about 
uh, access issues, thinking about um, if the rates are too low in some cases, that in some cases could lead to higher spending down the line if it means that you're not getting the, the basic care that you need. I'm really just speculating, Reverend, because I'm really not, not sure we need to dig in, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of the types of things when we dig in that we'll look at. Thank you. And then what might be my final question um, has to do with CMS compliance. As they're looking at um, equity, just wondering, can our, the fact that we have such low rates put us out of compliance with CMS? And now that we actually have data to illustrate, does that make it ever more important to increase the rates? Uh, thank you, Representative. It's a, it is a great question, and I, it's, it's complex in that, and I, in order for CMS to, I mean, I'm thinking about how I want to phrase the question. Um, there would have to be a link between the rates and lack of access, and that I think this always comes back to the same fundamental question: whether that is why there may be a lack of access, let's say for people with disabilities or for children with, with autism or you know, other people that we serve that have disabilities. CMS has really not sanctioned any particular state because their rates are so low that access has been, has been such a concern. We've not really seen that in, re I, I can only talk, speak for the year that I've been here. I've not necessarily um, seen that, but we're very conscious of that. And I think that's one of the reasons why having this rate study is so critical because it does allow us to have a, a really more granular view as to where that risk might actually lie. Because that isn't uh, necessarily, obviously, the way that we would want to run our Medicaid program. We'd, we'd want to run it in a way that provides as much access as possible. But there isn't a state that isn't struggling with this same issue. And I think that's part of the practicality that CMS brings to its oversight, its governance, and its partnership when it's working with states. Where there is an issue, CMS does not move directly into the sanction space, right? It and we see this all the time in the relationship that we have with them, and I think many states have with them. They are more of a collaborative partner. They will necessarily raise up a concern that they might have. Uh, so uh, I was gonna think of an example, but that's a different agency, that's FNS and SNAP, but, let's, but let's, let's use it as an example for the feds in general, right? So the feds will say, Look, we're sort of no, you know, we're monitoring access, we're we're monitoring rates, we're we're looking at what you might have. And you might, you state, we think you might be running into a bit of a problem. So we'd like to speak with you to just to get kind of give you some guidance, tell you how you compare to other states, and maybe give you some tips and tricks as to how you can move yourself back into a space of compliance before we have a more sub substantive conversation around sanctions. That is generally how CMS works with states. We have not had, again, a year and one month, we have not had that conversation with CMS where they said, look, we think there's a real problem with what you're doing. We think that there's a, a specific issue with you're not providing access in particular areas. Uh, and as you can see, and even when we compare ourselves to the five states that we've chosen, you know, the, the rates don't, it, it's, it, with, with the behavioral health, right, as the outlier and it's, it's a specific exception, uh, don't necessarily show that as compared to those states that our rates are so pre precipitously lower than those that it could then lead to a conclusion that there is a barrier to access as a result of that. The other side of that, though, and I think this is also what, uh, what every other state struggles with, is within your budgetary constraints, could those rates just generally just be higher, right? And the, and the senator spoke to uh, comparisons to commercial rates and other kinds of benchmarks that you could use. And I think that is always a more than a philosophical question that many states are struggling with. But the practical matter is that no state, especially one that um, is as small and wonderful as ours, would ever have the kind of resources that Medicare would have, to Guy's point earlier, to compete in this commercial space or even a significantly higher Medicare, or sorry, Medicaid space. So we're just, so this report really does provide us with the outcomes, sorry, with comparisons that really keep in mind the framework in which we are operating budgetarily and, uh, and also with respect to the socioeconomic status of the people that we are serving. Which, are, which you don't necessarily put in writing when you're creating these kinds of reports. But, we, but when they asked us, as we were working on the report, 
tell us about Connecticut. They know Connecticut well, but tell us what you think is important for us to know with respect to your member mix. What is it that you're really looking for? What is your legislature looking for? They ask very, I think, thoughtful and pointed questions about who are you trying to serve? What problems are you trying to solve? And you know, what should we really be thinking about as we're working in, in, in this space? I know I really asked answered more than what you asked about CMS, but I think it's important to know that this was a very thoughtful process that we tried to engage in. With that in mind, are we inadvertently or you know, deliberately engaging in a lack of access because of rates? Okay. Great, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, uh, hold on one All right. Well, we are over time right now, but we have one more question from Representative Johnson. Much appreciated. Just quickly, did we take into consideration the actual hospital rates and compare them with the other states to see how we uh, come out with that? And you don't have to uh, give me an answer now. You can tell me offline, but thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. And we didn't. Yeah, I just um, we, we did not. In phase one, we, we focused on the portions of the Medicaid program that the legislature told us to. And so we, um, hospitals are coming in phase two. Thank, thank you, Representative Johnson. I uh, would just want to thank you both uh, and the whole DSS team. I can see a big chunk of the department here and uh, I'm grateful for your engagement on this issue. We're um, you know, going to be moving forward. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Representative, <laughs> Representative McCarthy, you have. Yes, and I apologize very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to comment that how much I've appreciated learning about this rate study. And, you know, it's been such an issue. We, we hear all of us here about the Medicaid reimbursement. So just for uh, clarification, in the beginning of the presentation, we heard about seeking stakeholder feedback within the next six weeks. Could I just have clarification on that again and how that process will take place? And I'm sorry for the for waiting so long. Please oh, no, excuse. No, of course, no. Thank you very much for the question. Well, the stakeholders will fall into several categories. They will be our members that actually receive services through Medicaid. They will be providers, and that will include a as as large of a group as we can speak to in a six week time period. Uh, and they will also include some of our state agencies that also provide Medicaid services and supports. And although they weren't necessarily the focus of this study, as we mentioned, this is only 18% of all the services that are provided under Medicaid. So it, it's important to us that we talk to our sister agencies to understand what they're experiencing in terms of Medicaid rates and access as well. Those are the three primary groups that we're thinking of speaking about uh, speaking to right now. And it's actually very large groups when you think about it. Uh, because the provider groups within these five provider types is, is pretty substantial to begin with. Now, the way in which the stakeholdering will take place will be uh, several. We may have some surveys. We, we are big users of Zoom uh, at DSS, as I know we all are after the pandemic. These are, we've found that these are ways to really schedule and have open houses where we invite our stakeholders into the process because having such a short period of time we would prefer to go out into the community. Where we can, we will. But knowing that we are working under a very tight time frame, we will most likely have uh, more online interaction. And we will also be working with our uh, other community partners, and that would include our community action agencies that see many, many of the, the members that we support. And because we would like to get as much feedback as we can. And of course, there would be no feedback process that is complete without talking to our partners at our FQHCs as well. So I, I can't name every single partner, and I'm sure I hear on LinkedIn about the partners that I did not name, but I just want everyone to know that we're going to try to be as comprehensive as, as we can within the time frame that we have available. Then we'll gather that feedback and we will uh, find ways in, in which we can categorize it that might fall into buckets of commonality and then use that to make the recommendations as to what we can do with the state share of the $7 million. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. I, I do appreciate that response. And while you may not have hit everyone, it's it's it, it helps clarify what you were intending for the process. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the 
conversation. I know this is a longer process. We will certainly be in touch over the next six weeks and then beyond, and we'll work with the department closely on uh, the upcoming, the current uh, well, adjustments of the budget. So thank you very much, and I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of their afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.